right, here we go. Hi, everybody. Welcome to Space Sunday here at Adafruit. It's me, Lady Ada, broadcasting from the Adafruit headquarters here in downtown Manhattan with me, of course, Mr. Lady Ada Fast Space. But I have a special engineer guest with me today, Max Holly. Welcome. Hello, guys. Hey, hey uh, welcome. And we've been a fan of your work for so long. It's so awesome to have you here. It is so awesome to be here. It is a dream come true. Yeah, but uh, and you said you were the number one thing on your trip, but uh, we want to say that the reason you were on this trip is... Yeah, um, I was here to compete in a, in a Keysight competition, uh, the Keysight IoT competition that was occurring this weekend. It, used, it was supposed to be a Maker Faire. Yeah. Um, that didn't turn out this year. A lot of people did end up like, it's a fun people came into town this weekend because they were like, well, I bought tickets six months ago, but it's, it's a good weekend right, well, to visit. Before we get started, um, Max, what do you normally do besides come to New York City and, and potentially win IoT competitions? Um, I, I am a PhD student at Stanford. Uh, okay. I'm a grad student. I hang around and play with satellites all day. Fun. And I'd say for our um, CircuitPython community, you're probably best known for some of the boards you've made, a lot of the open source um, code that you've put out there, and kind of taking CircuitPython and putting it uh, essentially in space. And that's you're the reason we made this graphic. Look at this. <laughs> CircuitPython in space. So as soon as I saw some of your work, I'm like, we absolutely have to um, have you here one day, and the timing just worked and out. And this is an animation of one of the projects you worked on. So what? What yeah. is this? This is kind of cool. Yeah, we'll yeah. get we'll get to the, why you're here in New York, but let's start with what you normally do during during your uh, your day job, so to speak. So, yeah. what what is this thing, and, and why is it um, spitting out a bunch of boards? Yeah. In so space? the the animation you see there is is something I I inherited and, and sort of came to be uh, when I when I got to Stanford. I worked with a with a guy named Zach Manchester, a, a young professor that just hired on, and through his PhD program, he worked on this. On this project called Kicksat, and it Kicksat. was uh, it was kind of a cut star, uh, g g g satellite Kickstarter or something. What's, it was. Yep. Yeah. What, what's going on? So, uh, in in his grad school, he wanted to make a a small, uh, easy, accessible, open source satellite, uh, and and oh wow, those are teeny. They look he, really big on the animation, but they're actually like an inch by an inch. They are super tiny. Yeah. Okay. Um, oh, let me get something out of the way because people on Twitter like to watch our shows. Okay. Um, this isn't space trash. It actually burns up. There's this isn't littering space. So yeah. get that out of the way because like we have it's, it's we're on social small. media. So you, you have bet. To, yeah. You bet. That's always a, a common a common uh, what about what about question. So yeah. so these are little satellites and they're like three and a half centimeters by three and a half centimeters. So mm -hmm. they're like two square inches. And each one of them what what does each one of those little boards do that's being so, spun out? So what this animation was is, is something that we pulled off in, in February of twenty nineteen. Uh, we deployed a hundred of these things in low earth orbit. They were they were in orbit for about five to ten days and then they reorbited or re entered. So, re entered and so re entered means poof. Poof. They went yep. poof. Okay. And so uh, what they did is they demonstrated that it, it could be done for one, this is the first time anyone's demonstrated this small scale swarming type satellite work. And uh, since I'm not the most creative, uh, mostly what they did is they would um, say you could hear them from the ground with a handheld Yagi, and they would chirp out things. They have no battery, so when they had power, they would chirp out things like, hi, mom, hi, dad. <laughs> okay, so they had a little solar cell, yep. and there's no battery, and they just, it was a little, it's microcontroller on it that would um, listen, not listen to anything, it would just transmit. There was no receiver, there was just a transmitter. And, and then within a small portion of them, they did a uh, sort of a mesh networking demonstration. Ah. They exchanged packets, and then you could talk to any one of them from the ground and say, hey, how many how many nodes have you talked to? And, and You have and one here. Is this, is this it here? Yes. Okay, I, so let's, this is the, the PCB for one of them. So this is uh, unpopulated. So the radio that was using was... RFM 9X LoRa, which is one of your now your favorite radio. I, These I are actually a newer version. The ones that went up in space were still uh, heritage from Zach's grad school work, so it was actually an old TI CC 1101. Uh, I okay. Think. Um, Classic. And and when I came along, I said, hey, let's you know let's give this guy a refresh. Uh, and it was the Circuit Python refresh. Yeah. So so now it has a Atmel Sam D, and it talks to any sort of radio you want to put there. Okay, so you have the Sam D. You can program the micro USB, the little reset button, yep. little note frequency, a couple pins. Mm -hmm. What are these things here? So these are some uh, footprints for off-the-shelf DigiKey solar cells. Micro solars, yeah. Yeah. Okay, cool. And was that one of the goals? Is to keep the cost low and use off-the-shelf? You parts? bet. Um, and. 
These boards, I designed them for a hackathon we did in New Zealand. Uh, 24 hours, a bunch of students grabbed these and within 24 hours they had neural nets running on them, all sorts of cool stuff, purely because they knew Python. This is yeah. hardware, but they could do it. Yeah. Well, that's the big question I wanted to ask is, um, so why why Python, why Circuit Python? Because you have a million choices for programming languages, and there's probably some established um, methods to do software development for space. Yeah, I thought it was all FPGAs. So like, what's yeah. up with so this? Why, you know, why, why did you decide Python, Circuit Python? So so the thing with with satellites is um, certainly with CubeSats, sort of small-scale satellites, there's the unfortunate fact that uh, only about 15% of non-professional CubeSats achieve their mission. So mm. that means the other 85% are, are failing. And why, why do they fail? Do you guys know? So there's a, there's a whole lot of work here to study the community and see what's going on. Mm. Um, and in my experience, from all the groups and teams I've worked with, if it's not hardware that gets you, the, the software will get you. And and it turns out at the end of the day, a lot of times it's a software thing. Really? Yeah. Okay, so it's a lot of times people, they just don't... Uh, we'll have some guesses. Can they I, can haven't I? tested they haven't tested the software enough or they just don't expect. Well, how do you maintain it? You only have a limited time with some students if it's an mm -hmm. academic setting. And like if you're looking at C code, if it's not commented well, it's it, you, you're never gonna figure it out. So like Python, and this was my guess when I saw this, I'm like, oh, they might be doing this so other people can work on it. Yeah, um, it, it, you know, if you're building a satellite, you could be a you could be a mechanical engineering student. You could mm. be a you could be a data scientist. You could be a, a biochemist. Um, yeah. And I'll, at least in my experience, I, I'm not a computer science major. Um, and so, when I was getting exposed to satellites, my my C code was definitely my worst at my worst feature. Yeah, <laughs> to, yeah. To the design. One of the things that really, um, like I've coded in C for like, you know, like decades. And one of the things that's always terrified me is, you know, you just do reference the wrong pointer. You have an off by one error. Your memory gets corrupted, but you may not even know. Right. Like there's no, there's no protection. I mean, you can have an RTOS that does protect you, but now the complexity has gotten really yes. high. And then you put that in space and it like doesn't work. And, and you, you don't know you why. You can't go check it out. Exactly. Yeah, you don't know why. And that's yeah. one of the things that's really frustrating about like I actually still have like sometimes compiler link or things that are very subtle um, that you don't realize. And again, it runs and it runs, and then after two minutes, it stops working. Why? Because some memory got corrupted somewhere. It doesn't hit you till your stack gets there. So yep. it is these kinds of errors that um, you know C has some really good compile time checks, like type checks, but the runtime checks are like non-existent. You're you're completely abandoned. Mm -hmm. And is that what do you guys actually look at some code like? A student will put stuff up in space in a CubeSat, and then you'll analyze the code after the fact, and you'll find the error, or do you kind of like, is it just impossible? Oh, you bet. You bet you'll find the error. Um, yeah, and you're like, oh, shoot, like here you kind of went into the array, or what is it? Well, a lot of times, so most university CubeSats are written in Arduino, uh, because mm. that's the only thing they've been exposed to, and it's yeah. the most accessible. And it's easy to get started. It's easy to get started. They, they buy some Adafruit breakout boards, and, and they're on their way. Yep, and, but not designed for space. <laughs> not designed for space. Um, and before you know it, uh, they're chugging along and they're and they're putting modules together. But they make these beginner mistakes that we've all made. Mm. But the the consequences are in space. Are you don't get to go back and fix it. You know, it's actually a yeah. really good test. Well, it's so uh, expensive it, to deploy. This yeah. isn't just, this isn't just like it didn't blink on my desk. It's like. Oh yeah, all that time, all that effort, and my next yep. launch window is in seven years. Yeah, so it's game yeah. over. Yeah, it reminds me a little bit actually of people doing Burning Man projects. Very similar. It's like you have a project mm -hmm. and you're like releasing it, and you're like, you, there's no oscilloscope in the desert. You don't even <laughs> have a laptop, so, all right, so uh, then, that's a challenge. So there's so another thing. Uh, so you have the ones that we just saw. These are the ones. Uh, and then you get this massive, that, that, you know, fly out thing. Yay! Mm -hmm. And then it's this is pi cubed. Pi cubed. And this seems, bigger cube. This mm -hmm. seems like it. It's part of this project, and uh, Chunky's got relays. He's got this big radio, and it's got some payload, mm -hmm. and then uh, deep poly. So what? What's going on here? What is this all about? So what this board is is this board fits the form factor of what's called a CubeSat, and that's sort of okay. the standard that folks uh, convened on um, years ago for this. They were putting rockets up in space, and they. Someone with deep pockets was was paying for the launch, and they put their their doodad in the fairing of this big rocket, 
but there's all this extra space on the road. Yeah, yeah. What do we do with it? And and that's how and. We need out, more space engineers. <laughs> <laughs> turned out we shoved CubeSats everywhere in okay. these, and that was a that was a more accessible way to get into space. And that's been around for many years. All right, so it's like six inches by six inches or whatever. Right, yep. yeah. So let's look at let's, let's look at this. Let's do a tour thing. of this board. Let's do a tour tour. So here is the chip, and this is what kind of chip is this? This is a Atmel Sam D. So this is running Circuit Python here. I see that yep. flash chip that's very memorable. We set. Yeah. And then is there a USB? Okay, the USB is over here. Mm -hmm. And then this, what is this radio here? So that radio is the the entire, so this board ran in the animation before the mothership. Yeah. This board was controlling the mothership and then it deployed the little guys. Okay, so this radio, this is the high powered version of this radio. You can even yep. see the big amplifier. Look at that chunky amplifier. Yep. So chunky. this is the classic uh, Hope RF sort of uh, extended version of the radio. Okay. And uh, it's just higher power. I think it's a one watt radio. And then what are these three? So this is for the radio? Yep, the radio is and there on the end. And then there's two GPS uh, connectors. Because um, if you don't have the ability to uh, control the attitude of your satellite, yeah. and you want to get a GPS fix, and if you put the antenna on one side, uh, this the GPS patch antenna. Yeah. It, it turns out that you can get into multiple situations where you won't be able to get a lock. Um, and it's not really GPS. designed for when it's nearer the satellite. It's meant <laughs> I got a re it really question. Isn't. So when you're in space, uh, GPS probably works a little bit different, right? Like it does because you, um, you're not looking up. Essentially, I mean, you you might be, but you're not looking up in the same way that when you're on the ground. Also, you might get reflections off the Earth. I mean, who knows, man? Yeah. Weird. So the the and and from the get go, commercial GPS do not work in space. Uh, yeah. GPS are designed that once you're over a certain altitude and certain speed, they they don't work. Yeah, um, we have our, even ours have limits, like the, yep. because yeah. you're not supposed to like put you them can't, on missiles you, and stuff like that. There's the speed and the altitude, but usually if you're in sub-orbit, you're going pretty fast. You bet. So, um, yeah. So, COTS GPS don't work, and that's the one part of this board, that's the only feature, this entire board's open source, uh, pycube.org, yeah. um, and the only thing we can't do for you is tell you where to get these these special GPS that's okay. left as a, as a exercise, to exercise the, for the user. So go on the is, is this actually um, a controlled item? Um, so that's where, yes, the ITAR things start okay. to get, but that's the only one, and what's actually on there is a commercial, so the footprint fits commercial uh, GPS. And well, suspicious of like like U blocks, but uh, what do I know? Yeah, I don't know. what do know? I know? Yeah, what do I know? And it, okay. Aaron, it looks like someone took the sticker off. I don't but. know. Okay. Anyways, <laughs> so you got the you got this is the GPS. What's this over here? Is that part of that? Is the amplifier? That's actually a powered RF splitter. So okay. to get a GPS to work with two antennas, you actually have to power the split because most okay. GPS antenna patch antennas are, are powered. That's cool. All right, and then over here, what's solar? I can kind of guess. What's D poly? So uh, D poly is the is when you are when you are stuffed inside these launchers for these CubeSats, uh, your antennas can't be in their final resting place. And so there's a lot of clever ways of strapping your antennas down. And then once you get spit out of, of your deployment, you there's a specific time that you must wait, and then your antennas can can deploy. Yeah. Yep. And and so the the deploy are are paths where these, so the relays are controlling, are, are in front of these burn wire circuits. Oh, these are burn wires. And oh, so, so, it's, so it's a polyfuse. Yep. Uh, and, well, so it's... No? It, there's a lot of different ways to do it, and I tried to set it up such that you can do a polyfuse if you'd like. What this is going to do is dump a lot of current <laughs> yeah. straight from the battery. And so what we did is we ran it through a nichrome wire, which yeah. heats up. And so it's it, vaping in space is what you're saying. It's vaping yeah. in space. Love it. Okay. Oh, that's really clever. And then, and it shoots them out and it deploys the antenna. So it's the, the right relays. Way. Interesting. Yeah. And then what's what's like this section over here? It looks like it. So that's yeah. a that's a regulator. Okay. That's how we're. That's it's how a power we're, supply. Yep. A, a more efficient uh, regulator to get us down to 3.3. .3. And then right below that is a is a solar charging circuit, a max power uh, point tracking okay. circuit. Uh, for the for the solar panels. Okay, and then here's the fun part. So it's the payload. Yeah. So tell me about this. So this is what the students would design. Right. Those are those are places for you to put put your own designs. Um, the it's has an SPI bus, an I2C, and UART, and and the way you can mux the SAMD pins means yeah. you can put all sorts of things on there, and that's to be whatever you need it to be. I okay. put some of my research on there, but the the spacing between the two pads, if you notice here. The, Point uh, one inch. You can put a, a header on there and oh, fun. use so you a can, cable. If you yeah. Want. Yeah. 
Oh, neat. Foot switch. What's that? So part of the CubeSat standard also is, is when you are stuffed in this pod, there, are, there must be at least two mechanical inhibits that cut your batteries off from the rest of your circuit. You can't be operating inside. Of course, yeah. And so the foot switch and the rail switch are two uh, options for these inhibits. And they're, they're mechanical switches that while they're depressed, you're never getting any juice out of the I battery. I get it. So this is in line with the power. So just it's a safety interlock, which yep. is a good idea. Yep. All right. So this is okay. cool. So, so I got a question. Yeah. Um, so you did a talk at SmallSat. Yeah. And this pro and I saw, um, independent of the Circuit Python stuff, I saw people like tweeting, talking about it. Are universities using this design? Are they gonna? Are they? Did they contact you? Yeah, it, it was wonderful uh, feedback from the SmallSat conference. Over over sixty universities have reached out that want to either incorporate this into an existing curriculum, use it on an upcoming launch, or use it as part of a club. Because before this, um, it would actually take multiple boards. So the CubeSats, a lot of people have been using things from Heritage, and it's a it's a matter of. It's a juggling act from, yeah. from old hardware. And to get something that would, the bare bones, like I just want something, a box to work in space and- It has the minimum requirements. Yeah. 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 You're looking at about $8,000 from one of, the, one of the various vendors online. Yeah, yeah. Um, and that's- I'm in the wrong business. That's the status quo. So how much would, like, uh, you know, I don't know if you're selling this, but if the school was to order this from, you know, a fabricator, how much would this cost? Um, minus the secret GPS, which we don't know about. <laughs> minus the secret GPS, you're looking at $100 total okay. um, bomb cost plus... So you can actually get effect. one that's to each student. That's a great price point for yes. um, lots of failure. You bet. And that's that's a good thing. This is where failure is good. Like $100, not a big deal. $8,000... Right. That's tough. Per, per tested board is not so great. You bet. Right after my talk, a university reached out and said, hey, we're having a launch in about three months. We have burned up our second $8,000 motherboard, no. and we just can't afford to do more. Yeah. Can you help us out? That sucks. And, and so if you go to pycube.org, there's a Google form there. I'm, I'm, I'm going to try to get as many of these out to students, anybody, uh, hobbyists, anybody that wants them, putting together a short, short run of these, and I'm going to get them to you. Uh, hopefully at no cost or as low cost as as close to at cost. Yes, yeah, this looks cool. very manufacturable too. You did some good decisions. It looks like an Adafruit product. That's why I'm just like, hey, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I think this is good. It's like there's, it's not a lot of through hole parts. The through hole parts are far away from the surface. Mark. I've sometimes seen people, they'll shove everything together and I'm like, you made it really hard to put together. But this is, this is manufacturable, and I think you know you could get a quote from like Macrofab. They'd probably do these for like 20, 25 bucks a piece. Cool. So. Yeah. Yeah, I think that that is, you know, it's a, I don't know if I would have a student put these together because there, there are quite a few parts, but definitely this is a fabricatable thing. And yeah, it would be less than $200, which is, which is awesome. Yeah. And if you notice the board is, is more than half empty actually. Yeah. Um, tons yeah. of, you have four payload slots and this huge chunk here for empty the logo. Space, yeah. Yeah. And so it so can expand. You bet. And, and uh, it's a great opportunity for folks to go to the, the GitHub, fork it and go to town. Improve it. Um, everything's done in KiCad, so uh, you can download your PCB layout software for free and, and just have a ball. This is so cool. And, and then uh, tell oh, me, oh, so I said quite much more, so I'm going to the Pi part. So now we know about this board. Mm -hmm. So tell me about using Python on it. Like what, you know, what, so you said, like, see, you have this problem, people are making yeah, these big was, mistakes. That was my question. So like well, there's question, radiation so. testing, data collection, and you're doing research and all this. Like how are, how are you, gluing that all together with software. Yeah, what, what's CircuitPython? How does that yeah, mesh with this? One of the first criticisms, especially from the from the more seasoned satellite folks, is, oh, Python is slow, right? But there's Are there no satellite way. gatekeepers? <laughs> there, you find any niche, <laughs> yeah. and there will be gatekeepers. Okay. <laughs> well, at least they're consistent. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Yeah. Um, and so that was that was a lot of the criticism in the beginning. And you know what you find out is, is uh, the, the underlying C modules that you're calling from CircuitPython, they're already all there. Right? Yeah, you the know, SPI is like, you're sending a huge chunk of data and yeah. then it's DMA'd, so it doesn't actually matter. You bet. Um, the SAMD51 has a lot of DMA. I mean, I, I definitely understand that. I think, I sometimes do little comparisons, so people are like, oh, how fast is the SAMD21 running Python? I'm like, well, it's about as fast and flexible as the AT Tiny 85 in Arduino, which mm -hmm. I like, but is is underpowered. But the SAMD51, 
is actually when running Python, you get the same performance as an Arduino Uno. I feel like it's very similar performance, actually a little bit more, but speed wise and how much code you can fit in. Um, yeah. But there's also the time of development, like. But yeah, but it's like it's a dollar more, and like you don't have to deal uh, with. And maintainability, like where where do you want to spend? Where do you want to save time? I guess is a big question. And for yeah. students that were maybe falling flat because they don't fully grasp the concept of pointers in C, you know, it, it all it, it provides a, a. There's so many built-in fail safes for you. Yeah. The whole aspect of how Circuit Python, MicroPython is structured. This this VM that's running that you can reinitialize at the drop of a hat yeah. is actually a get out of jail free yeah, card in so all, many cases. As yeah, you're doing you, stuff live. So yeah, as like, you, well. you get an exception, it tells you what line. Mm -hmm. you're, instead of just like, oh, that's odd, my code isn't working, well, I'll just press reset, no big deal, and then it goes space, same thing happens. Here, you're, you're going to get that feedback that tells you, hey, here's where your error is occurring. It isn't a silent failure. Yep. So during the development process, that's valuable. And, and a lot of times, it, you talk to enough of these university and, and hobbyist satellite folks, and a lot of times they're just trying to talk to another SPI thing or I2C or UART. Sensor, whatever. Yeah, they're just trying to use a sensor, and they, they don't need... Uh, or want to deal with the overhead of managing an RTOS or something that uh, CircuitPython can do in just a couple lines. Yeah. And so it was so much faster to get students up and running on this, trying, it, it's, the analogy I used in my talk is, is you wouldn't, you wouldn't ask like a, like a chemist to build their, or fabricate their beakers before doing their experiment. Yeah. yeah. So why are you asking, you is off-the-shelf beaker perfect? Maybe not perfect, but it's pretty close. Right, and and so why would you ask a, a scientist to build a, a CubeSat when all they're trying to do is collect, you know, solar intensity data? Yeah. So try to decouple the two, and if you want to learn how to build satellites and dive into this, hey, this is a good place to start. You know, you can take it apart and learn how it was put together. Um, but it's a it's supposed to be a stronger foothold for for folks going future to the future. All right. right. Yeah. Oh, you got, you I have one, one last question. So have any of these Python boards actually been launched? Oh, you bet. So, okay. so this exact board was what was driving that, um, that animation oh, that you saw. Oh, so that actually, what, that, yeah. this happened? This happened. And it, did it work? That's, you bet it worked. That, that's okay, why cool. I, well, I, I, wouldn't, I, I wouldn't be able, <laughs> I wouldn't feel right about saying Circuit Python in space unless, you know, there was some Circuit Python. All right, well, that sounds good. And, and the students, I got, now I guess that's the killer question. So the students who've been making the CubeSats and the satellites, have they gotten better than 15% success rates? Well, so I, I can't, I, we don't have enough of uh, PyCube boards in space to, to have. To find out. We, but we are one for one in terms okay, of this good. board design. <laughs> All, right. So. All right, so as next time we have you back in a year, uh, we're gonna ask you how you know how that works. I'm interested. I mean, I'm I'm actually okay if it is it 100. percent I want to learn you bet. what didn't work out what, because we what can. It's like it doesn't. You're not blowing eight thousand dollars. Right. A try. Yeah. And now I bet you you're gonna have more uh, students when there's only one module for people to work on. That's the bottleneck for development. When mm. everyone can have one of these sitting on a desk, the whole dynamic changes. Everyone yeah. is working on it and hacking on okay. it. Okay. Cool. So next up, um, you've been doing a lot of stuff with the time of flight ranging capability, the Semtep SX. 1280, I think we yeah. have one here. We yeah. do have one. Oh, yeah. that's yours. Get and then this. I showed off, I have one. You yeah. can get these off the and then shelf. You also um, showed how it works with these things. And then uh, we have one here okay. as well. So, yeah. so, yeah, what's up with this cool chip? You, here's your feather you made out of it. Yeah, so. Um, uh, what is this thing? I what's was, it good for? I was learning about LoRa and, and seeing what all the, the latest and greatest radios were. And I was reading about this. The, everyone uses the SX twelve seventy eight. Yeah. And, and I, I, then I heard about also this known as RFM nine X. RFM nine X. Yeah, yeah. Um, it, I have a handful of feathers at home, and and that's what I learned Laura on as well. But then okay. I heard about this twelve eighty chip, and it actually had some cool features. And it, it's from Semtech. It's been around for a while. And one of the one of the fun features is it built into the chip, built onto the die, is a time of flight measurement capabilities so it this sends a all the new hotness the hotness well yeah. we want to know where things are position wise and uh this can give you a a position uh measurement between two nodes so two distance so you know how far they are what centimeters millimeters it, meters what's the range here? um so this has a sub meter uh accuracy okay and 
so far, I've only been able to get it to work once the nodes are farther than 50 meters apart. Mm. I think that's a function of the the modulation of the of the lower modulation because of the, the the wavelengths and yes, bouncing. The, the, the chirp mechanism of LoRa, I think, is what's inhibiting anything less. So it's good for very wide spread nodes, but still handy because you can tell how far away it is. You bet. And prior to this, I. I know of ongoing research, academic research even, where groups have 100 meter accuracy time of flight de demonstrations that they're extremely proud of. And it's been yeah. a hard, lot of hard work to get there. So the fact that you can get less than a meter yeah. on chip and was awesome. Uh, so I bought one and, uh, and then realized that I couldn't find any Arduino libraries. So yeah, no, because it's so new. It, it is fairly new, and so um, I bit the bullet. Wrote a wrote a Circuit Python uh, library. It's okay. rough around the edges. I'll I'll say it there, but it works. Okay. And, and you have a breakout. And I, and and then that meant I needed a breakout. Couldn't find one, so is I this, made one. Is this good for use in space too, or is this for terrestrial um, researches? So. Uh, Coming up this this quarter, uh, so this going we are going to be teaching, uh, Zach Manche Professor Manchester and I are going to be teaching a capstone course at Stanford, uh, and we're going to have the students build and put a satellite in space, and I would I want it to use these chips. Yeah. Can't say for sure if it's going to yet. It's at 2.4 gigahertz, which means uh, you take some range hits. Interesting. Uh, that Yeah. I've seen more time of flight. You know, the new ESP S2 coming out also yeah. has time of flight on it. Ooh, cool. But I don't know what we know what the range yeah, or specification is. And it's one. the I've seen, you know, the um, RF-233, the Atmel mm -hmm. RF-233 has it, but you need to have two antennas at... Um, Interesting. It needs two, it, it, two antennas at 90 degrees okay. to do the, the ranging. Yeah. Um, because it does, I think it does the delta of the... It, oh, you know, it, has, oh it, it would pick up on one and yeah. Yeah, it, I think mm. it looks like oh one is going this way. I, I'm not 100 percent sure. The exactly clock on that must be killer fast. <laughs> I think it's it's a it's a it's a 2.4 gigahertz I think, and it's you have to have a you know 24 megahertz clock. But yeah, I guess I I don't know. I've only heard about it. Yeah, so this is typically something that's been a uh, above the hobbyist level of of mm. accessibility now. And what's cool is now. Uh, it's a single line in Circuit Python, yeah, <laughs> which has been really cool. So it allows me to have students. We're all going out into the field and, and taking measurements. You can start calculating topologies of swarms, yeah, and that opens up the doors to all sorts of cool this distributed networking stuff. PhDs love mesh networks. And distributed. <laughs> they love so it. So hot right now. <laughs> I know. It's well, like, well, it has been for 20 years. Yeah. No. <laughs> and, and this gets into the, the IoT world as well, in mm -hmm. addition to space, because Internet of Things, well, like, you know, uh, MQTT started out in space. There's a lot of IoT I did stuff. Not know that. That's cool. Yeah, uh, we did a video about. Um, it was for a was pipeline for communication to satellite. That's why it mm -hmm. has little mini packets because it could. Yeah. Yeah. yeah you and then send it was them adopted and you by like Facebook Messenger, which was never intended for that. Boy, that was a good idea, you know. Cool. So you um, space. Way so, cool. So speaking of this is, and we're getting back to why you were here. Um, so you were a finalist in the IoT Innovation Challenge from yeah. Keysight. So. Uh, did you get a Keysight scope? Yeah, so this was the Smart Water Almost. Challenge finalist. <laughs> and um, I'm going to play the video sure. that y'all submitted. Yeah. And then we'll, and on the other side, we'll come back and maybe you can talk through um, what you entered in. Sure, sounds right. good. Okay, take a break. Quality is one of the main challenges that societies face and will continue to face during the 21st century as it translates directly into environmental, social, and economic problems. The potential solution is through continuous water monitoring in aquatic bodies in order to detect early chemical leaks. But this ideal solution is often found to be surprisingly uncommon and expensive. We found that the issues are caused due to materials like silicon and PDMS packaging that current sensors are based upon. These materials have issues with foul leak, which means that it cannot be submerged in harsh aquatic environments for longer time. One of the most prevalent pollutants in water causing this is ammonia. To combat this problem, we are effectively combining several technologies from brilliant, innovative minds to bring out the optimum solution. Combining a state-of-the-art, energy-efficient membrane ammonia sensor developed by Professor Tarpe and the microprocessing technologies of wide band gap gallium nitride transistors from the Sensky lab is just the solution we looked into. 
The Sunski lab itself has fabricated several sensors made from gallium nitride for NASA and it has been tested with an extreme environment successfully. The combination will make it a novel sensor, making it sensitive towards ammonia detection and at the same time more robust than competing sensors available. These advances will allow us to have an edge by being able to operate the sensor for even over a year in extreme environments. We will use a microsatellite technology that has been effectively developed by Professor Manchester. He has made miniature satellites that were deployed from the International Space Station and we will leverage this to create the integrated IoT solution from power to transmission. The device will be powered using renewable solar and LoRa patented technology for transmission to the cloud. We plan on creating an IoT solution to one of the world's most pressing concerns and result in protecting our natural Okay, so you're a panelist. And so step us through. I got three of the images uh, okay, that were on so the site. What's this? So there's this, this, and this. this. So what's going on here with the uh, with your work? So this first image, we've seen this before. This was, these were yeah. the sprites we were just talking about. These are the tiny little satellites. Basically what this is is it's a it's a little microcontroller breakout board that we've put through a lot of hard environmental testing. So it was a great place to start. If we want to put something in water or out in the elements, yeah. we it's know good these, enough for space, it's good enough for underwater. That yeah. was our that was Got our it. philosophy too. Okay. Uh, so that was a, a known working starting point. Okay. And then the the goal of this Keysight competition was to um, try to make an impact uh, in terms of the land and water monitoring IoT projects that are out there. How can we collect data that will help make a difference. Um, what's useful, what's needed, if we're putting a bunch of IoT nodes out, what, what can we do that would actually be useful? And uh, after doing our research, um, my, my teammates and I, especially Anand, who really, really pulled the, his, his weight on this and, and spearheaded this whole effort, narrowed in on the fact that it turns out that um, knowing the ammonia concentration in water is incredibly helpful. It helps you predict if there's about to be an algae bloom, mm. which turns out algae blooms are what are the, the predominant method of, of killing off aquatic life and, yeah. and such is when, when pollutants that have been put into the water uh, develop and feed is algae. Is that this? And so what we, what we found is that commercial, yeah, commercial ammonia sensors weren't, weren't up to the task. And the the standard uh, for measuring ammonia concentration currently is you go send a scientist out, he'll take a sample of the water and take it back to the, the lab, lab and, then, and, like and you have to later, do spectroscopy on it. Yeah. And um, that was our opener. We, we collaborated with the, with the TARPA group at, at Stanford who had just developed a really good way of extracting ammonia from urine, so basically water treatment. And yeah. we coupled our ability to sense things with his ability to remove everything but ammonia and we put it together and the result was a was an ammonia sensor an in-situ ammonia sensor that was 5x oh, more well, sensitive a little board in there yeah. yeah and wouldn't you know it the the node that's driving the whole thing was a LoRa sprite and to get the power down i put a good old adafruit tpl 5116 i think Did i get yeah. right 5116 handy yep. easy effective oh extremely effective if you yeah. don't want to chase down the no it's the for lazy modes, people no you just you like you, it just turns it off and then a minute later it turns it back on or two hours or whatever you want you bet so easy it, it, that if you don't want to spend the time in the embedded world that's how you get a low power project up yeah and running um and so we put this uh, together, and and the video that you saw there, the clip, was what got us to the final round. I was going to uh, say, so you're a finalist. What was the result? And after duking it out yesterday, we won the whole darn thing. Yay, congratulations. Yay. So, yeah. so I, you know, when, <laughs> yep. well, when I, when I saw you, I, I said, oh, do you still have that big check? You have to go to a big bank and, <laughs> and cash it. But like, look at this check. It's a gigantic check. Big, yeah. grand prize. Congratulations. That is a big yeah, check. Work. I remember uh, I parked it in the corner of the conference room there, and, and uh, it almost got towed. It was such a big check. Yeah. Yeah. It took up too many parking <laughs> beep, spots. Beep. When you back up. Beep, beep. <laughs> yeah, okay. All right, congratulations. Thank you so much. Right. That was uh, that was probably the most polished event I have ever been a part of. Keysight okay. knocked it out of the park there. That's great. And it was cool to see, so it was cool to see a, a, a chain of corporate 
that were doing this purely because they wanted to see cool, cool ways of helping the environment. Yeah, um, that's great. And that was inspiring for all of us. Uh, it's what inspired us to do the project and, and take it on. Uh, now Stanford is, is really excited about this new way of chemical sensing, and, and we hope we can make a difference with it. Yeah. I like that you, you have a couple bets, it seems. Well, you, there's a theme. It's like making all this very accessible, but it's also like, well, we can use this to see like how messed up water is, but we can also use this for space stuff because we might have to leave. <laughs> you know, it's like, you, you know, we, we probably have to do both at the same time. You bet. Um, so you have other stuff going on. Um, you're you're busy. You're at Stanford, so there's, a, there's a couple things. You got um, a MEMS <laughs> course that you're working on, and then you have the soldering course. So tell us about the, um, uh, we got these. This is, uh, this is the that, other thing That's the thing for. we showed off. Well, yeah, this is the SAM. Well, you have the SAM 32. Yes. Um, so what's this MEMS course that you went in with uh, Professor? Yeah, what's going on Powell? here? Yeah, so... Uh, I, I'm, I'm starting to build the reputation, uh, at least within my my circles, that... Competition went in. Well, and I'm the guy that builds stuff. <laughs> yeah. uh, so everyone's like, you know, there's a lot of... Th they have a lot of theory. Mm -hmm. And then you actually have to make the thing. Yeah, sometimes... So you're the person who makes the thing. Sometimes you got to make the things. And, uh, and I like teaching people to make things, too. And so I like uh, helping out with the courses and, and making stuff. And so one of the professors came to me, Professor Howe, uh, Roger Howe, and, and he said hey, we're, we're doing this MEMS course, and it's historically been very theory-based, and, and, and we'd, like to, we'd like to build some stuff. You know, what, what could we build? But MEMS is, MEMS is tough. MEMS, it's small. Yeah, MEMS you know, means you're in a clean room, right, making, yeah. uh, making very tiny things in silicon. And so uh, Professor Howe showed me how to turn that up on its head, and we... We you made this. Structured a class that can. Which is, is this um, funny because I saw this. I was like, oh my god, is this like every diagram of a MEMS accelerometer? But it's huge. You bet. It's a macro MEMS. A, a max, max, what would you call it? A max MEMS? Yeah, it's like a max MEMS. <laughs> I well, because like you're max. So. I like that. Max I want to. TM, yeah. Yeah, I want to <laughs> trademark that. Okay, um. so you can, you can squish this. So what, what happens when I do this? So. This is exactly, this is a scaled up version of how the accelerometers, you, uh, many of the listeners may know the Adafruit IMUs that are out there and the... I remember the, the was it, the ADXL 100? So when it 100? physically moves, that's, this, but you're just, this, but you made a giant version of it. When yeah. you shake it, well this isn't, you're not going to see it, but if it's very small, this shakes when you have acceleration. Correct. And so typ typically this happens in silicon, you never see it at, at scale like this. And uh, what we did is we created something that the students could design on a Monday. I will ship it out to a PCB fab um, and have it back by the next week. And they'll actually get to test their own, excel oh, this is an accelerometer design. design. Oh. And the way I'm doing it is I'm using a capacitive sensor and I'm measuring this is basically two two plates, and it's yeah. a it's a parallel plate capacitor. And kind of see. as that little spring that that trampoline moves, it will change the capacitance like a, of the like circuit. Like a half a picofarad, but yep, yeah, but yeah, you can measure that. You bet. And and beep, so beep, 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 beep. yeah. The I, I used a TI chip that's really fun. Um, it's the FDC twenty two fourteen. Yeah. Um, and oh, it makes it. I wrote a circuit Python library for that too. Um, it's like a 24 bit ADC or yeah, what? Yeah, 28. 28. That my mind. That's so many bits. I know. <laughs> and it, so, so you can measure femtofarads wow. uh, with this thing. And, okay. And it's super easy. And so, what you can what, do. What, over is, I squared C for real? Yeah. Almost be like one sample a second. Um, it's, it's slower. Uh, you can get it faster if you want to sacrifice some, some bits. Okay, um, so at 28 bits, how many samples per minute? I haven't tried to push it. Um, we're looking per minute. We're looking at a couple hertz. This okay. isn't very fast. Okay. Um, All right. Well, but actually, you know, I say that, but for the class, we're so for the class to characterize this, you can put it on a speaker and and measure and measure sound. Oh, that's, oh, that's fun. A um, that's a good way to quickly uh, yeah. get some demos going. Yeah, and it okay. turns out it, the students will plug this in and they go, "Oh, Max, it's broken." It, it always reads about nine. What's this? What's this mm, nine? What's the weird offset? <laughs> and uh, and then I go, well, do me a favor, turn this turn this ninety degrees. And uh, once they get it, so it's the trampoline isn't up and down; it's it's on its side, oh, goes away. What's what up with that? that? Now put it at forty five degrees. Yeah, and then but yeah, that's exactly. weird. It's sinusoidal. What does that mean? <laughs> All right, so, so they learn about gravity in this course too. So like that's that. uh, that's gravity. Uh, yeah. That's Can, the is it sensitive enough if you go higher? 
the gravity is less? Um, you know, I haven't I haven't thought about that. It's so like it's nine point eight meters per second squared for escape velocity. So you could like right do something kind of so you could put it on, you could put it on a little rocket. Maybe you, you bet you can yeah. put it on a rocket. You can. We have students strapping it to their jeans and doing yeah. all sorts of fun stuff. The top because of a mountain or this something. This is cheap, right? This yeah. is easy. You, you can make these. Swing you can yeah. swing it, and then um, uh, it turns out it has a function of how how massive your trampoline is. So yeah. what happens when you put a mass on it? And yeah. then That's So cool. so this is a way. Uh, I know like many others. I learned by building things with my hands, yeah. right? And and that wasn't very accessible for MEMS people. And, and this is a chance to actually get your hands on an accelerometer. Okay. It's one of the Which challenges with own. physics because now you can also have physics students because, you know, gravity is a weird thing. Like it's, it's super weak, except for it isn't, mm -hmm. you know, cause we're stuck on it, but it just take, you know, it's like, okay, we're on earth and like we're stuck to it, but like, it's not a very strong force, but you can, so if, it does a lot. It, it holds the oceans. Yeah, it does. In, right? does yeah, yeah, it does quite a bit. Amazing. Um, Super okay. cool. You, you, so you made this board that. Uh, it goes this with is it. One, this is the other, uh, the other board people in the Circuit Python community yeah. know you by. Um, it was one of our first boards on CircuitPython.org/downloads. So thanks for doing that. Cool. And that's that's yeah, awesome. Um, we have, we're up to seventy-four boards altogether, and this is uh, you called it the Sam Thirty-Two. The Sam Thirty-Two. Yep. This was my. Uh, this was. This was an exercise and a and a, uh, a, a fun example of building a board, but it, it became a Swiss Army knife for the the embedded folks that I was working with because it sort of is a jack of all trades and it helps you do a lot of embedded projects. It has a has a ESP32 because it wouldn't be a, it wouldn't be a modern project without that. Yeah, and I glue it on there. <laughs> Got an SD card slot on the SD bottom. SD card. Um, it has a SAMD51 on it as well. It's like your favorite chip. And oh. you, did, you did something that no one else ever does. You have an enormous amount of documentation. In fact, sometimes I look at your GitHub repos and I look at your documentation because you do these neat things where you can embed the bill of materials and you, you're you're it's rare to see someone who likes doing documentation or you despise <laughs> something so much that you do documentation. You know, yeah. I, I've learned by reading other people's stuff and I can't say documentation is my favorite, but if other people can learn from what I'm doing, mm -hmm. uh, all, all the power to them. And yeah. so you got quick start. Part I a classic of, under construction. I come into. Yeah. Yeah. You'll notice the quick starts. Don't go to that one. Okay. <laughs> no, no. Uh, if you scroll down, the fun thing on this one is, Click one of the example codes on the left there, like a blink. So this shows you what libraries you need, what hardware is oh. needed, and it has some code here that you can copy and paste. And then I then I show them another way to do it, and, and this is a way to sort of expose some students. I like to play with ways of, of getting information out there. Mm. I'm you're using Notion, which is something I'm poking around with because I'm like, this is kind of neat. Like yeah. you're using yeah, it in a very interesting card. way. Yeah. What what SIM card? Um, so you got to working with like a SIM card. Scroll oh, down. oh, so if you Scroll if you down. go down NVM York Bridge and then at the bottom see under GPS is SIM card. Oh, that one's empty. But if you go to my GitHub, there should be an example there. Yeah, I have a. All right, well, folks. So I have way. a uh, uh, Circuit Python project working for for three G based things. Uh -huh. um, it, it works with the SAM32, and it's something you stuff inside the handlebars of your bicycle, yeah. and you can send it a text, and it will respond with your GPS location. Oh, that's that's fun. nice. That's yeah. what people yeah. want Check to do back. sometimes, too. Yeah. Check yeah. Back. Okay. okay. And then cool the, the last piece of all this is, um, you know, you still have to solder things, mm -hmm. no matter what. And so you have, like, one of the best soldering guides oh. out there. Thank you. Um, nice photos. And so this is, this is something... Um, I think the other one that was really good that we used to send around is like NASA had like kind of a, mm -hmm. it's getting older, but it's like, it's an older PDF. Guide, yep. yeah. It's in its, yep. it's in its twilight years. Um, it but that's one, that's one of the places where it's like, well, NASA did a pretty good job, but this is one of the, the few places where we can point people and it seems like you're using this and it's getting updated and students are giving you feedback. Yeah. It, working in the, in the maker spaces at Stanford, uh, especially lab 64, the, ele the electrical engineering department's makerspace, there were there were too many students yeah. with, Ooh, with bad nice solder joints, and so um, you know I I'm a soldering nerd. I really like it, and I tried to condense all my knowledge for a first pat. You know, you don't know anything about soldering, or you've been soldering your whole life. Uh, 
I think there's something to learn by scrolling through this. And I tried to make it as visual as I could. There's lots of GIFs. I use yeah. some great yeah. videos on Okay, YouTube. like this is the on Twitch. Well, I think that's the thing is like, I, I notice in your work, you're using a lot of modern technologies for things that really haven't had that attention. Like yeah. we've been doing stuff in space for, it's gonna be coming up on like 60 years, 70, 80 years. Yeah. And you're doing a lot of things with modern technology. Same thing with the documentation. There's animated graphics. Like when we put those on our, uh, the Adafruit site, immediately every other site started doing that. Yeah. And it was just like, well, we thought it was like, it was just helpful for the learner. Right. But like, these are, these are things like telling people like, okay, you have to brush the solder off right. or something. You could do that in text or you can just show it. And you, and, and you showed it. And you could throw all this in a single video too. But, but at least the way I, I, I watch YouTube videos and, and tutorials and stuff, I, I find myself skipping around and it's yeah. like, oh, I, I missed yeah, that part. these are like part. chapters. And so having something that loops that you just get to watch over and over again and then you read some text and you're like, oh, I didn't catch that part and you go look again. Yeah, um, like people, the way people learn, I mean, I think we've always um, learned best this way, but like it just was really hard to get this kind of technology, but I love gifts for teaching and demonstrating stuff. These big photos. Because we're, we, you know, you reading, it's, really it's nice. tough to explain a lot of these things with reading. Um, it gets very technical, it gets very boring, people kind of gloss over it. I think comic books are the best way to teach and yeah. explain something. And gifts yeah, kind of let you comic do books. comic-y style teaching. Well, here's the other thing, because you're doing this not as a online course, there isn't the buy button, there isn't a lot of distractions, there's no pop-up, there isn't, you're not, you don't have to put your, all your contact information to get a link to this thing, no. and then you also have a quiz. Yeah, you bet, I have a quiz, uh, something yeah. to test your knowledge. Um, Ooh and see how you do if you are a so oh this will be good i'm curious to see if the quiz comes up for you um no, we didn't read the whole thing no i'm in safari right now so i don't know i'm, I'm, I'm pushing so I'm, it through a video and i'm working on getting it uh to pop up more easily uh because i've also integrated that into part of the curriculum for the hopefully for the all labs um at, at stanford in the engineering department uh you should at least have to pass this quiz to yeah you have to be this tall to write I like how ride. it has like large through hole parts smaller large soft uh, so, um, surface mount parts and then smaller like you know they you work your way down yep. to you know from SOT 223s which are my favorites down to 0603 so that's good practice so I, I mean the tutorial was inspired by Adafruit uh, learn.adafruit.com which is you know, I frequent that. Yeah. Um, we'll have 2,000 tutorials um, on like Monday. Monday. Yeah, we're getting there. There's, there's, <laughs> it's such a resource. You can learn so much by, by going through those. So I had that up while I was designing this, what pieces I liked. Yeah. The quiz is a Google form that you fill out. It can be immediate feedback. And then there's a hands-on quiz where you get to test your skills yeah. with an instructor and, and get instant yeah. hands-on feedback. It's yeah. good to get them to do at least some of the stuff first so that they come into it, they know what they're going to, you know, it's, right. it makes it easier for the instructor to teach a bunch of people very fast. I'm assuming there's hundreds of students yeah. per semester okay. that you have you to yeah. um, before crank we, through. Before we tell everybody where they can find all this, um, what do you have coming up next? What's on your, your to-do list? Oh gosh, um, lots of projects. So. This quarter, we're, or this academic year, we're excited. Uh, we're gonna uh, take a group of students and- Send and, them to space. And, and, <laughs> and send their design to space. So in a, single, in a single class, we're gonna have them design and put something in space. Okay. Which should be super cool, using excited the, about using that. Using the Pi It'll be Pi cubed based, yep. Um, okay. We're gonna scale it down and, and- You know, tuition costs are always high, but if you're doing that, it starts to That's sound pretty cool. like a pretty good deal. Yeah. How like, cool is that, yeah, right? Like I put something in space. Um, you can work at a, historically. You could work at a company for a, a decade and and not have flight heritage under your belt. Yeah. Man, so to I'm come jealous. out as for a senior design class and to say you've put something in space, talk about a resume builder. We were talking to um, Dean Kamen, uh, who does First Robotics, mm -hmm. and he hangs out with like all the Boeing executives and everything. And he was telling us that, uh, and he was in like you know, one of their private planes or something. And he's like, oh yeah, the thing that they told me was all the people who are doing aeronautics are retiring or they're really old. We don't have enough yeah. of them. And it's so hard to get into it. And if you're doing those types of things, you just get recruited off to Google or Wall Street right. or Facebook or Fang, you know, the whole, you know, Facebook, Amazon thing. And, yep. and it's really hard to find people. And the other thing is it's so difficult 
to get things in the space. Right. And, and you're right. Imagine saying, okay, kids, study for 10 years and then work for 10 years and maybe, just maybe, maybe, probably not, your thing might be in space. Yeah. It's a tough sell. It's a big yeah. ask. And, but nowadays, space is getting more accessible. People are putting up more yeah. rockets, more things are getting there. Um, and probably in our, in our lifetimes, we're going to be a space-faring species. We're we gonna, might have to. That's the other thing. Like, you we'll bet. See. Yeah. You bet. And, and um, that means someday my you know, cowboy bebop uh, uh, dreams are going to come become we're a reality. Almost done. We just um, we downloaded okay, this. We're, we're almost through this. <laughs> um, okay, then the big question. I want the corgi. Yeah. Well, the the big question is what what can people do out there that would help your efforts of making this accessible for everyone? What what can people do? Um, you know, it's all open source. Uh, the the most I can ask is is fork the project and tell me what I did wrong. You know, file an yeah. issue on GitHub. Yeah, you're so smart, right? You're, you know so much about space technology and how wrong he is about Python. Prove him wrong. <laughs> Find mistakes it. in his hardware. Find um, mistakes in the firmware. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and then, let's and all then help submit PRs. Yeah. <laughs> yes. And, yeah. And, thank you, request. and thank you so much because this is one of the things that um, when we started CircuitPython, told the team, I'm like, you know, we know that we're doing a good job when we see some of it in space, when we see some of it underwater, when we see it help um, the accessibility community. These are all the things that we're personally probably not going to be able to do, but if we make tools for other people to do this, then we know we have, we're on to something. Yeah. And, you know, you're not just a checkbox, like, y you are, but, like, it's like, thank you, like, it was, it was so neat to see this, and we've never met until today, and that's one of the neat things about open source. Um, Lamore and Scott and the CircuitPython team, they put out all the stuff, you use it, and then it literally can go out out of this world. Like that's, that, that is neat. You bet. And you don't hear these stories as much either. So thanks for Yay. also coming by. Well, thank you guys, because um, I have learned so much from you two and the entire Adafruit community and all the forums and Discord and everything. I, I mean, this is how you take people that who knows if I would have ever broken into this space if I hadn't had the the building blocks to play with from the get-go. Yeah. Um, it was just too yeah. intimidating to begin with. I'm just psyched that we have another great example of how Python on microcontrollers is useful in industry and for educational. I mean, like, I would never would have, I've never done CubeSats. I've heard of them, but again, I heard, like, oh, they're $10,000, so I, it, I didn't even realize, yeah, the first wow. Like, when they came out, I'm like, I want to do something like that, but I saw the price tag, and I'm like, we don't sell things that are $8,000 on the yeah. Interfruit site. We just probably won't. We, we might end up selling these. We yeah, might like, do cool. a run of them. Totally like, why not? That be? Yeah. 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 All right, so if people want to find out, um, you're active on the Twitters. You're Max, I got the Twitters. Yeah. Max Holly 404. Yep. Holly. And then um, I would say. cubed. Yeah, and I would Google say uh, folks should watch your GitHub repo. That's that's how I kind of keep an eye on your stuff. You you're, can RSS feed it. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I should learn how to do that. Yeah, you have there's to, a couple. They it's hide like it. Adam yeah. RSS. Oh. You can do it, but it's nice. Um, but those are the two places. My GitHub is active, um, and you'll find links there to all the various other places. Yep. Okay. All right. Soldering tutorials and all the design resources and. All right. Well, thank cool. you so much, Max. Yay. Thank you, guys. Thank you for coming. This was so awesome. Yeah, this was great. Awesome to be here. All right. Here. Check out Max Holly's GitHub, his Twitter. Check out PyCubed. If you're into CubeSats, uh, this seems like it's going to be a real space opener for people. Yep. Thank you for coming on the show. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for having me. All right. Thanks, everybody. Right. Good night. Python in space. Like, uh, space. Yay. Space. <laughs>